So we're here today at the 86th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Biological Timekeeping, which is being held virtual this year. Um, so that's the Zoom call. So my name is Luke Smith, and I'm an associate editor at Plus Biology. And I'm very pleased to, to be joined today by Dr. Mike Russ. Um, so thank you for joining us. Sure, happy um, to be here. Yeah, great. So Dr. Russ is the director of, of the Institute for Biophysical Dynamics at the University of Chicago, where his lab studies both the fundamental mechanisms of the circadian clock, as well as influence of the clock on organismal health and physiology. And um, so one of the systems that Dr. Russ studies is photosynthetic cyanobacteria. And I was interested to listen to your talk this week on that topic uh, and some of the insights that you uh, derive from the, the bacteria. And um, so I was thinking today that we could chat about some of the exciting work that you've done to find uh, the circadian clock in these bacteria and also um, its relationship to cellular function. And so first, um, I wondered if you could just give us a bit of background on cyanobacteria themselves and, and circadian clocks in, the, in cyanobacteria. Um, and basically how they contribute to understanding of circadian rhythms and what, why this is a useful model organism. Sure, right. You might think nothing, nothing could be farther from a person than a photosynthetic bacterium, right? Um, so for, a, for many years, uh, it was sort of, it was believed there was a dogma that bacteria were perhaps too simple to have circadian rhythms or they didn't have the requisite internal complexity. So a cyanobacteria became exciting to me because they were really the first prokaryotes uh, in the late 90s to be shown to have a uh, really a true strong circadian rhythm. And I think the, the power of these organisms as a circadian model system is really twofold. One is that the, the, their clock machinery has turned out to be biochemically far more accessible than in an animal. Uh, including this famous finding from Takao Kondo's lab that it's possible to rebuild the clock essentially in a test tube with purified proteins. So that's a, that's a tremendous advantage if you want to get at mechanism and what is the fundamental basis for how does the rhythm, how do the proteins measure time, what's the origin of stable oscillation. And then the other a great advantage of the system, I think actually a very important question that the field has touched on, but we still don't have great answers to is what properties of circadian rhythms are actually needed for health and fitness and how does that depend on the environment? So this, of course, this is a very pressing question because the environments that we live in now are very different from the environments we may have evolved in um, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago where we have access to artificial light, we live on irregular schedules because of our jobs often. Um, so, so what the actual relationship is between clock properties, clock function, and then health and fitness, uh, we certainly have hints, but it's, it's hard to map those things out uh, in an organism that grows slowly or that you can only study a few at a time, like a mouse. So the great, uh, one great advantage I think we'll see in, in the future uh, with these microbial model systems like cyanobacteria is you have you can have huge numbers of cells whose clocks are all running independently studied in the same flask. So you can ask, you know, which mutants are growing faster than other mutants, things like that. Um, and so, as I mentioned, your lab has done some really nice work defining the mechanisms of the circadian clock uh, in cyanobacteria. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your contributions um, to defining what circadian rhythms and what, draw, what kind of cues these rhythms in, in uh, cyanobacteria. Sure, uh, I'll kind of, I'll kind. I mean, I, I guess I want to stress here that I'm, I'm kind of summarizing the work of many labs. I don't want to. Yeah, make yeah, I should. Like yes, yeah. all coming from us, but I think some of the major findings are that uh, the time in the clock is really so. So the, the core oscillator is made of these three proteins called chi A, chi B, and chi C. It's from the Japanese word for cycle. That's what chi means. Uh, one one key finding is that the the basis for the slowness of the rhythm, a large part of that really comes from the slow enzymatic reactions that chi C catalyzes. So chi C is a, it's a hexameric particle. It has six, six protein copies together in a ring, and it hydrolyzes ATP and phosphorylates itself with that ATP. And the rate at which it carries out those reactions is just on the scale of a day. So it's somehow intrinsic to the protein structure in ways that are not so clear really they're not completely clear yet, but it's it's built into the catalytic properties of this enzyme is the slowness of the oscillation. So I think that's one major 
discovery that the slow time scale in this case is actually coming from um, a protein structure. Like it's not about waiting for two things to stick to each other or waiting for a protein to be expressed or exported from the nucleus. It's actually like the biochemical properties of that molecule. Um, yeah, I think that's fascinating. Um, is, is, there, is there other an analogous like enzymes where it's just the cycle is built into, like in, in other species where the cycle is built into just the dynamics of a six, you know, single or set of proteins or... Yeah, so, uh, you know, when I read the literature on, <laughs> on the animal clocks, of course, I, I come at it with this bias where I want to see parallels <laughs> to yeah, the bacterial yeah. clocks. But yeah, maybe I'm I, asking you to speculate here, but... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my impression is that you, like it, it's maybe uh, has become increasingly more appreciated that this phosphorylation of proteins like PER uh, is really a key part of determining why the whole feedback loop takes a day to complete. And so that's an example where like, you have these casein kinase isoforms that bind to PER and phosphorylate it. And I think it's you know, I, I guess if you looked at it from the Chi-C perspective, their Chi-C is both the enzyme and the substrate, essentially. So you have Chi-C molecules stuck together in a complex, slowly phosphorylating themselves over the course of a day. Now, casein kinases can often be highly processive and be bound to their targets for a long time. So it's possible there that you also have uh, casein kinase bound per slowly phosphorylating it just kind of in this complex, and that may just take hours to happen. So um, I think if you squint, you know, if you blur the, the fact that the, gene, that the genes are totally different, there are some parallels. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, um, so I wonder if you could uh, discuss a bit of the, your recent work um, studying the influence of the clock on organismal function. And so I was interested to see your paper, your recent paper showing that the clock actually helps to time DNA replication of cellular bacteria. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wonder if you could just describe briefly your findings uh, on, on the influence of cir circadian clocking and replication. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, you know, one, one thing we'd really like to understand is what it is exactly that goes wrong when your clock is not matched to the environment properly, because it seems to be a universally shared thing that uh, kind of clock misalignment leads to disease or leads to loss of reproductive fitness. Uh, but the mechanism in a lot of cases has been kind of hard to pin down. And one thing that we sort of a clue, okay, I guess I should say a common theme between bacteria and, and humans and uh, plants is that it seems like the outputs of circadian clocks are often to do with metabolic regulation. So clocks read, they read in part signals from metabolism. They also direct metabolism through expression of metabolic enzymes. Uh, so we started to think, are there metabolic processes that might be, uh, it might be very important that they be under clock control. And we started to think about DNA replication because it turns out in cyanobacteria, it actually takes a few hours to copy the genome. So um, if you think about it from that perspective, the conditions in the environment when you initiate replication might be quite different from a few hours later when you're actually finishing making the whole chromosome. So we started to think that might be a reason, that you, you know, one reason that it might be important to have a clock is it's like you commit to doing something like DNA replication, you sort of have to finish it. It's not good to go to just stop in the middle, um, but you need to know something about the future, right? When you decide to start, you have to know what's gonna happen um, a few hours later. So it turns out, after kind of building some technology to monitor replication in single cells and watch them, uh, watch what the cells are doing, it turns out that the, the decision to replicate is uh, highly, uh, is under strong regulation from the circadian clock. So basically when things are functioning normally, uh, initiation of replication is supposed to most likely start in the morning and basically everything is wrapped up by the time that the sun is setting so that you go into the night without open replication forks. Um, what we also showed is that if you, if you make the clock state incorrect so that you basically night falls when you still have open replication forks in the, in, in the early part of the clock cycle, 
those replication forks fall apart rapidly. So the, the replication machinery basically falls off the DNA and throughout them the whole night, you have these partially finished chromosomes that aren't able to, um, it's, this cell's not able to, to wrap things up. So I think this, I, I think this raises a lot of interesting questions about uh, potentially the mutagenic effects of not timing DNA replication appropriately. Yeah. Um, so we're hoping to get at that in the future. That, yeah, it sounds really interesting. And um, so I was wondering, so this is, this is a photosynthetic organism. And so it, I, so I wonder what, what cues drive this uh, rhythm in, in DNA replication. So is it, is it cued by light intensity? Or is it, was it, does it have some memory that it was just dark and now it's light, so I should start? Or what, what do you think um, it cues it basically to, to initiate replication at the right time and then not to do it in the evening? <laughs> I see, that's a good question, right? So if you, if you have the cells in constant conditions, you get rhythmic replication that's just coming from this internal oscillator signal. Okay, so there may so be on top of that, a perception of light directly, like brighter light, for example, might lead to more replication. So you sort of, maybe you can tell the sun is starting to set. And so you, I don't, we haven't really explored that, but I think in for most organisms in reality, outside of a lab, they're integrating both information from the environment, like how bright is it actually right now? And also this internal timing signal are used so, together yeah. to make a decision. Um, and in a, kind of along the lines, we've been discussing kind of the connection between the findings of cyanobacteria to other organisms, but I wonder, do you, so do you think that um, similar cycles exist for replication? Or I, I know we've heard about cycles in DNA repair and things like that. And, and I wonder, like, do you think that they would be as strong in other organisms who aren't need, need to be tied to, you know, sunlight, basically? Um, yeah, in fact, I think there is some evidence of this that in uh, in tissues in, in mammalian tissues that replication is strongly preferred to happen at certain times of day. Even though, you know, of course, mo like most tissues are they're taking the, the, the turnover time for cells to go through the cell cycle takes. Um, you know, maybe weeks, uh, there are particular times of day where it's more likely for division to occur, for example. So I think that uh, that may well be um, quite kind of a conserved pattern. I don't know if the, the kind of severity of the effect where it's like the, you know, when you, in cyanobacteria, where you, when, what we see where you mistime it, where it's like the replication forks just fail. Um, I'm not sure that something that dramatic will happen. I think that really is coming from sunlight being their only energy source. Well, interesting. And, and um, what, you know, what other types of uh, cellular behaviors is, is the clock implicated in cyanobacteria? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's really, um, it seems to be involved in, in basically, uh, sorry, I'm spacing out for a second, <laughs> seems to be involved in uh, turning different metabolic pathways on and off. So for example, um, it's very important that the cells store glycogen to use as an energy source to maintain viability during the night. The way they do that is they don't start making glycogen right away in the morning. The clock sort of tells them to not turn on those biosynthetic pathways until you start to get towards the afternoon and then start building up glycogen. And I think the, the reasons for that are still a little mysterious, but that seems to be the kind of general uh, picture that rather than trying to do everything at once, you sort of schedule the clock schedules, like do some kinds of metabolism early in the day and some later in the day. Uh, I guess I should say it's a little bit of a strange thing, but the, the, the species that the cyanobacterial rhythm was originally found in uh, are nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. And the, the logic there made a lot of sense that the, the so this, these are organisms, you know, they're, compared to us, they're quite remarkable how they, they can live on basically just kind of trace minerals and nitrate or not even, not even having nitrogen present in the water, they can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. But there's this kind of famous incompatibility between photosynthesis that produces oxygen 
and nitrogen fixation because the oxygen tends to poison the enzymes that can fix nitrogen. Uh, and so there's, a, there's another example of a kind of metabolic, um, metabolic rhythm or metabolic partitioning where the clock in those organisms seems to tell them to do photosynthesis at one time and then fix nitrogen at another time. Uh, and it's not really, it's not like it has to become dark to do the nitrogen fixation. Even if you leave the lights on, the clock will still tell them to do nitrogen fixation. The reason I started out saying it was a little funny is that uh, the, the, these model organisms that are genetically so tractable that everybody sort of switched to don't actually fix nitrogen. So this, uh, apparently that's not the only benefit the clock plays, but I, that seems to be a kind of a, 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 I would say maybe a trend, maybe a shared trend across uh, many organisms is that you have uh, kind of switching or balancing of different metabolic programs at different times. Yeah, I mean, I find it fascinating how robust the, the clock is and, and how, how different types of bacterial bacteria have used it, harnessed it for different things. I think that's really an interesting point. It is. It is really fascinating. You know, I think one thing that's quite, uh, I find quite interesting is there's this whole um, clade of cyanobacteria that have sort of given up on a stable clock. They've lost one of the chi genes and they just have like a kind of hourglass or like a one shot clock that needs to be reset by the environment every day. Um, so I think there's a huge potential there to understand what are the what are the pressures that have made some of them keep sort of a full bona fide circadian rhythm and others have gone to the simpler system. Uh, so so apparently sometimes you need a clock, sometimes you don't need a clock. Um, does it does it have to do with like evolutionary origin? Is, is it like if you're a cyanobacteria that is always exposed to constant day, dark night, then you don't you can kind of dispense with your clock? Or whereas if you somehow sometimes they're buried or something, you know, is it have something to do with that? Do you think or I don't, just yeah, it, it 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 very well might. Um, so if these, so these ones that don't have the third chi gene, they've lost chi a. They come from an ancestor that had it. They lost it. They live closer to the equator. So it might be that, for example, having a more, uh, not having like seasonal variation, for example, in the day night cycle might be, make it less necessary to have a clock. But I think, you know, what excites me about the bacterial systems is I think we can get like solid experimental answers to these questions. Like what pressures lead you to have a clock or discard a clock? Yeah. Um, that we can sort of take it from the realm of just observing nature to actually measuring in a lab which variants are growing better in which conditions. Yeah, I think it seems to be a really, really powerful tool. I mean, we, I saw many talks at the meeting that were really, really interesting along these lines of just how, how in depth you can tease these questions apart is really uh, impressive. Um, so along those lines, I was wondering kind of what's, what's next for your lab and, um, you know, what kind of future directions do you see pursuing and, and do you have what kind of big open questions do you see that are there in the field of um yeah i've i i to, to be honest i feel like the biggest question is really to connect uh this understanding of evolution and fitness to the biochemistry of the clock so there are many there are many many successes in understanding the mechanism of the cyano clock. There are still important unknown questions like temperature compensation and things like this. But um, you know, to me, the big my, my, from my perspective, the big unanswered things are really a kind of uh, a kind of unification between that mechanistic understanding and then that like the evolutionary pressures that are causing the system to have certain properties to maintain a certain period and so on. Um, you know, like, like all, for example, this classic observations in circadian biology is that the period of clocks is not, it's never exactly 24 hours, right? It's, and in certain species, it tends to be a little longer and certain species tends to be a little shorter. Um, and there are, there are explanations for why that might be the case. But I think, you know, again, here, here's an example where you can potentially uh, 
but you can ask about the fitness of many mutants whose periods span a huge range and, and try to ask, is it, does it really, is it really a problem if you're shorter than 24 hours rather than longer, things like that. So I, what I really wanna do is have a map between um, all the physiology about clocks that is, we know a lot about in cyanobacteria, we know a lot about it in many organisms and map that physiology onto the, the costs um, for the organism in terms of its fitness. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really interesting question. I, I hadn't considered that, but I mean I guess we start we started to hint at it when you say some kind of lose this clock feature. So it seems like there's trade offs. What do you so do you have speculation about about mm. what could be the cost of maintaining a clock? Like it seems like oh from, yeah, for maintaining the clock at all. Yeah, I think it's so. So one thing we had we had a paper that kind of touched on this a few years ago now. Um, this is from Justin Chu, who's in my lab. Uh, so it turns out that, that actually cyanobacteria that have the clock, at least the one that we studied, they actually devote a substantial amount of protein synthesis to making the clock components. It's something like around 1% of all of the protein synthesized goes into the clock. Oh. And it's the need to do that to have a very reliable rhythm. So if you try to lower the expression level of those components, you start to get erratic rhythms. But in contrast, these ones that are um, that maybe don't have the free running clock, they seem to be able to make many fewer protein copies and still get function. So it may be that there's a kind of balance where you have to pay a big price to have a really reliable clock. And that in some situations, that price may not be worth paying. Like you can get something less sophisticated a lot more cheaply. Huh. So that's a possible trade-off. You know, I, I guess touching on that, um, so I mentioned there are these cyanobacteria that have lost one of the chi genes, but the two, so this is, a, I think this is also a very interesting question. The, 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 the cluster of three genes, chi A, chi B, and chi C is found only in cyanobacteria, but chi B and chi C predate cyanobacteria and you can find them in lots of archaeal species, lots of other bacteria. You can find them like in Pseudomonas species or Legionella, and really no one has any idea what they're doing. Um, so I guess one possibility, it would be nice to know <laughs> what they're doing. One possibility is that they're all kind of timing mechanisms that are like proto-circadian clocks that have not really developed the ability to oscillate, but they have something to do with measuring the length of the day. And then for some reason, only in cyanobacteria did it become advantageous to make that into this kind of full-blown circadian rhythm. Um, do, you, do you think that the jump is the jump to photosynthesis kind of thing or? Uh, yeah, it, it might be, yeah, it might be a sort of phototrophic kind of lifestyle, you know, that having this very, very intimate connection between metabolism and light. That it's that it's important to know, much more important to know really when it's going to be when the sun will rise, when the sun will set. That's possible. I, yeah, I mean, here just to throw out another random observation that you can edit out if you want to. <laughs> so there are some cyanobacteria that are that can live heterotrophically too. So they can grow photosynthetically, but they can also take up fixed carbon and other things from their environment. And if you look at their genomes, they tend to have an ABC cluster, like chi ABC cluster, like a true clock, but then they also have other chi C copies that are not associated with chi A. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so maybe, you know, maybe when you have multiple lifestyles, like some, for some things you want a clock, but then if you're living other ways, you don't want a clock. So I, I feel like there's a whole unexplored world of, <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, we're just scratching the surface and there's like a lot of heterogeneity to systems and approaches that, that are really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think the way I think the, these questions about how microbes um, cope with the daily cycle and like what range of strategies are there and where do you find them? Yeah, I feel like it's like a vast unexplored area, really. Well, nice. Well, um, I think we're at time. So, I mean, it was really interesting to, to kind of cover all these, these topics and, and hit, like, this seems like there's a lot of interesting work coming and a lot of interesting avenues to continue to explore. Yeah, um, we're, we're very excited about it. Yeah. Is there any, is there anything else that we didn't touch on that you'd like to discuss today or? 
No, I think this is a good a good summary. Yeah, I mean, I so um, I, yeah, I mean, I really was interested to hear about your work. I, I think it's, it's really, really cool. <laughs> it's really, really interesting. So. Yeah, I hope that I I think in some ways uh, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this. I feel, <laughs> I feel like uh, if you read the, some of the history of the study of circadian rhythms, there's a lot of very um, well, it's like very smart, thoughtful speculation about why clocks are the way they are and why you see them. My hope is that what we can really do with cyanobacteria is turn those from sort of um, philosophical statements into experimentally testable um, yeah. hypotheses. Well, I mean, it sounds like there's both tons of diversity and also they're very malleable system, it sounds like for you know teasing these things apart. So I, I think yeah, I mean, that's, that seems like a really powerful tool and um, like it could provide a lot of important insights into what is the clock and what is it for and <laughs> why the organisms need it. And so, yeah, I think so. I think it's uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity, a lot of a lot of things to be discovered. Well, very nice. Well, I think uh, we'll wrap up, um, but it was really nice to chat with you and um, uh, I, I think this is just the way these things end. There's, I think we'll just log off Zoom, but um, yeah. it was nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. Uh, yeah. Thanks for doing the interview.